Big Kev. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited. I am, I am beyond, beyond excited today uh, joining us here in segment two. Uh, this has been in the works for some time now, and I'm so mm -hmm. glad that it finally came together. And really, it's been in the works for some time all because of me. So I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be able to say welcome uh, to, to two individuals. One individual um, I've been a fan of for, let's say, half my life, and the other uh, individual I didn't know I was a fan of until several weeks ago. But as it turns out, I'm a huge fan of his too. Um, joining us today is uh, Mr. Stephen Banks and Mr. Tom McLaughlin. Uh, thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Fun to be here. So uh, just real quick uh, uh, about why, uh, uh, may I call you Tom and Stephen? I should have asked you that earlier, probably. Sure. Why, why, Tom, why Tom and Stephen are joining us today is because... Um, uh, several weeks ago, I'm, I, I, as you guys know, I'm a member of many groups on Facebook because, you know, I like to keep my finger on the pulse of late 70s and early 80s sci-fi. Uh, and one of those groups is um, uh, the Black Hole fans group, the, the fans of the Disney movie, The Black Hole. And as it turns out, uh, one day I happened to catch a post where, uh, where one of these gentlemen, Stephen, said, oh, yeah, I, I was actually an extra in the black hole. And I, of course, went ballistic because <laughs> as a black hole fan, as a toy collector, specifically a guy who likes to get toys signed, um, I immediately wrote Stephen and said, well, who were you? <laughs> you know? And he's like, oh, I was one of the Sentry robots. And I was like, oh, it's amazing. We started this conversation. And he said, yeah. And I know Tom, the guy who was Captain Star. And I was like, my head's exploding at this point. I'm like, please, if I get you some carded figures, do you think maybe you could sign one for me and get Tom to sign one for me? And, and Stephen was very gracious and said, yeah, I will work on that for you. I was ecstatic. And of course, Stephen's figure is expensive. Tom's figure is impossible from a toy mm. perspective, only released in Italy and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I had some made up in England. I had to send things to England, wait for them to get to England. Then they had to be created, then get sent to Stephen to get them signed. And, but in the course of all of that going on, I don't know why one day I happened to look at Stephen's whole name and it said Stephen Banks. And I was like, Stephen Banks, <laughs> Stephen Banks, hmm, I don't think, and then I took a second to look at his profile picture, and I was like, well, that kind of looks like Stephen Banks, <laughs> <laughs> that's Stephen Banks that I have known and have been <clears throat> sharing with people for literally half my life, that looks like him, it could be him, so what I decided was, well, let me look at some more pictures of Stephen Banks on his. I basically I stalked I stalked Stephen Banks on Facebook. You creeper, yeah, and creeper. yeah, I totally did. And then I realized that he was in fact the Stephen Banks uh, uh, of uh, of a thing we'll discuss in a, in, in a little bit uh, of a special of. Well, I'm just going to put it out there. It's the finest one man show <laughs> I have ever seen. A guy who grew up in theater and film and everything else. It is the single best. I've seen Patrick Stewart do Christmas Carol, one man show. Home Entertainment Center is a better show, my opinion. So that <laughs> I just said, have more props. <laughs> you do use more props. That's okay. It's not about the props. It's, it's <laughs> about the overall sort of feeling. Um, and so I gingerly wrote Stephen Banks, and I was like, so Stephen Banks of Stephen Banks Home Entertainment Center. And he's like, yeah, that's me. And I literally, you, my roommates will attest that I literally jumped up out of the chair <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. You know, like it was just amazing how many things. And then he tells me, yeah. And Tom McLaughlin, the guy who played Star in Black Hole, <laughs> He's the guy that directed it. And I was like, what? <laughs> just mind explosions left and right. So that's just a brief story of how all this came together. I asked the gentleman if, uh, I asked Stephen if he would ask Tom if 
um, they would be interested in joining us for a segment on the show to talk about these these many things. Um, and they agreed, and that's what brings us here today. So without any further ado, why is Stephen Banks not mentioned anywhere in the credits or any other literature that I have read about Black Hole, but Tom McLaughlin is actually named in the credits as Captain Star. But he didn't have a manager. If he had a manager, (laughs) you'd have a name up there. (laughs) Well, I wasn't in the union, and I'm only in it because Tom, who is my best friend, uh, uh, called me up. They needed people who were like six feet and could move. Most a lot of mimes, some dancers, mostly mimes. And I was just paid as like a glorified extra um, a, a, a day. What well, didn't get in the union until later in Tom's movie Date with an Angel, and then so that's why our names aren't on there because they don't put extras name. And now they do, and I guess right. at least they put everybody. They put people who walk by the set uh, on the screen, but <laughs> in but it goes by so yeah. fast you can't read them. Yes, I know. I hate that. But yeah, so that's why that that's how it, I think that's why it's not in there. I mean, I've mentioned it sometimes in interviews and so forth. Uh, it was a long time ago. But yeah, it was uh, it was a great it was a terrific experience, which we'll we'll tell you about. Yeah. <laughs> but Tommy oh, was a he had a part. He had a real part. He had a name. Yeah, he did. And, and you know, what, what's really exciting uh, uh, about that is that um You know, it's just not one of those things that you think about so many years later that, wow, I was in a Disney movie. You know, I think think about it. (laughs) Well, we we were very excited. We were a couple of, you know, Disney geeks. So it was a big deal for us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How did did that come about for for you, Tom? Well, interestingly enough, um, my ex-wife... Um, Katie, uh, who was, I had a group called the LA Mine Company, and she was part of that. And then we ended up getting married in a slapstick wedding ceremony. And when the act broke up, sort of the marriage broke up. And she called me and she had heard that they were looking for somebody to choreograph the humanoids and the sentry robots. So I came in really as a choreographer stunt, you know, you know, to do any of the stunt stuff that had to be directed. Um, and you know, for me, it was like, you know, who are you getting for the centuries? And they said, well, do you have any ideas? I mean, luckily, you know, Stephen and I had a number of other friends that we knew that were all in that six foot. So, you know, I was able to bring them in. So it made the whole experience a lot of fun because it had all the pals there as part of it. And then in the course of doing the movie, Gary Nelson, the director came to me and he said, we want to create a part for you. And I went, Really? And he goes, yeah, we're going to like write something. It wasn't in the script to have you do this Captain Star robot shootout thing. So that's kind of how I ended up being in the movie. And I was shocked as anybody about why I got credit with all these lofty superstars, you know, in there. But I was very happy to to get the credit. And occasionally, you know, I get the residuals for $10, $15, sometimes $3. I was going to say, what does a a check (laughs) for 68 cents look like? You know? (laughs) You know, we've got. It's, it's too bad you don't get a nickel every time it plays on Disney Plus. I, I bet you get a stack of nickels there. So, Stephen, we know how you came in because uh, you being friends with uh, uh, with Tom. Um, but what I'm wondering now, 106 years later, is can you pick yourself out? Do you know what scenes? Oh yeah, no, I can because I because I remember. Um... Uh, it was, yeah, uh, Don Lewis, Mike Corcus, myself I, were, were mimes who were in the uh, in it. The other names I can't remember, Tommy might remember. And when we went out on across the, the, the big bridge in that scene right. where we march out and turn, um, I'm, the, I'm the fifth one from the right. So I, I know who I am <laughs> when I, I just thought, I'm going to remember because when we did that, it was very interesting. They put us in those outfits and man when they put those on they they didn't snap like the face place on they screwed it on and once they screwed it on you couldn't like pull it off and breathe or whatever it was screwed on then you walked up to this guy camera he's great he goes step into my office and he would spray paint so they would hide the screws so you'd have to hold your breath because he was just spraying full-on paint spray paint in your face so we all got up there the first time to walk across that bridge 
and we all get ready and they go, okay, let's just try a take, you know, or not a take, but actually we walked out. It was terrifying because we're very high up. The, the bridge was, I don't know, four feet wide, maybe four and a half feet in width. And it was a drop and there were no nets. There was nothing below us. And so we all walked out like real tentatively. We were supposed to walk out like, you know, mean, scary sentries. And we all kind of <laughs> walked out like the scaredy cats we were. So they go, okay, we got to fix this. We got used to it. And then I remember they just put mattresses below us, very far below, which we might have hit or might not have. Luckily, no one fell. But <laughs> then we got used to it walking out on that bridge. And then we were able to go in our, you know, robotic movements and turn and so forth. But no, it was scary. That first time, I can still remember that. It was very scary looking down. <laughs> so basically, they 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 screwed you into a helmet, dosed you, and asked you to walk in a straight line. Yes. In the late 70s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was... Yeah, that was Hollywood. Yeah, well, because we, I mean, we were, I guess we were glorified extras. I think we got, I don't, I get nothing. I get no residuals or anything from the movie because I wasn't in the guild yet, a Screen Actors Guild. Um, but yeah, and they had those slant boards like um, the Tin Man in uh, Wizard of Oz that you could, because you couldn't sit down once you did right. it. We wore like mm -hmm. long red underwear under underneath. I don't know why. And I remember walking around the Disney lot in the long going to lunch, let's go. And we just <laughs> walking around, long red underwear and going to the commissary. Um, and we thought we should at least put jeans on or something. So then, then at least we look sort of like, I don't know, a band from the 70s. <laughs> what was the buzz like going into the film? Cause this is at the same time around Star Wars and Star Trek, which was obviously hugely popular. It was after Star Wars. So it was kind of, even though I know this thing had been in development before, it was after Star Wars and, you know, who Disney had turned down Star Wars. And so it was like, to me, at least it sort of felt like they were jumping on the bandwagon and it was going right. like, hmm, this is, you know, wh why are they doing this? And I also remember they had a big, Tom, they had that, the big thing was the secret of the black hole. No one's going to know what it's like when they go in the black hole. And they had the storyboards on these huge panels on the sound, on the sound stage, I, I remember, as I remember. And then of course they had that whole section like blocked out or it wasn't up and supposedly, what was it only Ron Miller and the director knew and whoever drew it. I, I don't think it was Ellen Shaw, whoever drew it, what was gonna happen once they went right. into the black hole. For us, and for me, it was exciting going onto the Disney lot and, and um, it being in a Disney movie. I mean, that was thrilling to be on a sound stage and, and that was, that, that was yeah, the first movie I'd been in, so that was just exciting. Tom, how did you feel? So, yeah, that's what I'm. I'm. I'm about to ask. I'm like Tom. So, did you have the same sort of experience? They screw you into that suit too for your uh, for well, your big yeah. shootout scene. Well, I was sort of an old hand on that because uh, I got hired by Woody Allen to work with him on Sleeper. So I was in that you know robot thing too, and then you know I, I played a mutated bear in Prophecy. Uh, the Jabberwocky and Alice in Wonderland. So I was used to the, you know, the suits and all the, you know, the drawbacks of having to put a human being in that. Some of those things were like 150 pounds that you were carrying around, like, you know, with the, uh, the Jabberwocky. So yeah, it was, it was, uh, it's a tough gig. And I, I you know, it's got to be really thrilling, as, as Stephen said, and I imagine it's uh, the same for you, Tom, if, if, uh, if you can say, but was, uh, you know, the, the being on the Disney lot and doing a Disney film, I mean, in that era, that's kind of like the, you know, what, what some people refer to as the beginning of the dip, you know, before yeah. they, you know, before they kind of went a, a bit south for a couple of years and then came roaring back. So, you know, well, I, I, I'm wondering what, what it's like, you know, what it was the like. The exciting thing was, you know, Peter Ellen Shaw and all these sort of classic, you know, creation, creative people from Walt's day, you know, were a part of that. And that was mm -hmm. wonderful. Ron Miller, to all of us, was a football player that married into the family that was now in, running the studio. And there was, you know, one time where I, I went in to watch the dailies and, um, there was, it was the director and, and Ron and maybe one other person. Nobody really cared, but, you know, me wanting to be a filmmaker, I definitely wanted to see it. And it was the first time they were going to show the, the, the graphic of the uh, black hole itself. And, you know, so we were sitting there and, and Ron goes, um, 
is there any way we could see down into it a little more so we could see the depth of that? And oh, it was a visual effects guy. And he goes, I don't know, that cost a lot. Okay, forget it. And then I thought, there it is. I mean, Walt would say, I don't care how much, make this happen, you know? So mm -hmm. it, was, you know, it was a time period, obviously, before the new regime took over and, you know, and really sort of, you know, Splash and all those things came in. That was right. like, well, what are we? We, you know, part of Walt's old vision? Are we trying to come up with something new? What are we? And so it was a strange period. But for those of us like Stephen and I, who are huge, nostalgic Disney fans, just to walk in that studio and to, you know, walk around and eat in the commissary and stuff, you know, that was a big thrill. Oh, it, it was great. I mean, and you could also, this was nuts. You could also walk around, you could go into the animation building. No, it, it was a separate building from the animation building. This person showed me this room. You could go in, anybody could go in, and they had all the matte paintings like uh, that Leon Shaw from previous films, like Mary Poppins. Wow. You could literally just open this drawer and pull them out, touch them, you know, pull out these glass things on this like drawer that slid out and look at them and touch them. They were big, it would be hard to steal, but <laughs> well, just a, it was just a drawer, you could walk right in. And then also in the, in the main, the animation building, the displays they had on the walls of the cells were original cells. Now they're all copies. Um, right. But uh, that's the thing. It was just, you know, to, to be on the soundstage where they did the Mickey Mouse Club. I mean, that was incredible. Later, I did meet Annette on the, <laughs> Annette, the Annette on the soundstage of them, and they brought out the old uh, Mickey Mouse curtain, which was pretty thrilling. Wow. But uh, it was, and part of the Zorro set was still there. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were very young. It was just, it was, it was very exciting. But as what Tom was saying, the money thing, like looking at the robots and the little Vincent and those that flew around, when you looked at them, it wasn't R2-D2, you know, it wasn't C-3PO. There wasn't that attention to detail right. at all. Um, and I remember seeing it the first time and I mean, now they've, maybe they've erased them or it's Blu-ray, I haven't seen it, but you can see them. But I mean, you could see the strings, which was like, hmm. Well, you wouldn't allow it. No. If you know where to look, <laughs> You can still see. I don't know. Do you, are, have you guys? This is this is a good question to ask. Have either of you seen the film in forty one years? I watched. I watched part of it. one day. Um, I also <laughs> wrote an animation. I was working at uh, Nickelodeon, and I was head writer of SpongeBob SquarePants for about six years. Yes, sir. And I was walking out one day, and I saw this guy. It was like like six thirty, watching the black hole, and it was. Right out of a perfect day, I was coming right up to the century scene where we walked across the bridge. And he, you know, he's watching it. And first I went, Why are you watching this movie? <laughs> and he goes, Oh, and he was young, much younger than he goes, Oh, it's great. I love this movie. I go, really? And I didn't say anything. And then the thing I said, I said, see that fifth century one? Yeah. I go, that's me. What, dude? What? What? And then, you know, we <laughs> talked and so forth. Um, I know exactly how he feels. Uh so yeah, it's, I mean, I've seen parts of it, chunks of it and so forth. Um, I think if I'd been younger, a little kid when I saw it, I would have said, this is great. Um, but I think the age and having seen Star Wars and so forth, you know, it just, it, it, you know, script wise, I mean, great actors, my God, they had incredible yeah. actors in that incredible. movie. Incredible. Yeah. Um, uh, and that was cool to look at the guy, wow, there's Yvette Mew and there's Max Shell and, you know, all, all the people that were in it. Um, yeah, we wanted to love it. I mean, we were there to go, this has got to be great. And then you're sort of going, eh, I don't know. I don't know. And yeah, we went we opening always, day. Remember, Tom? We went to Century yeah. City when they had the movie theater there. And we all went there and uh, to to watch it because we were excited. Yes. Yeah, and, and you know, and 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 rightly so. So now, now I don't know that you guys, <laughs> you know, I don't know that you guys know this or not, but you know, it is on Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. So there are, yeah. you know, a generation of people who are enjoying it for the first time. Yeah. Um, two fifths of the people in this room right now have recently enjoyed it for the first time at, ah. at my behest. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the things that I find really funny about it, and Tom, maybe you can, uh, you can appreciate this maybe um, more than anybody. Disney left the Entra Act Day music on the Disney Plus version. So wow. it literally plays two and a half minutes of music with black screen. 
And as I understand it, there have been people who have been contacting Disney Plus saying there's something wrong with this black hole movie because <laughs> it plays two and a half minutes before anything of just black screen before anything happens. Do, do they do um, the overture? Do they play the, it, wasn't there an overture initially? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what. Yeah, I think we're talking about the same yeah. thing. But yeah, well, that's the middle. The entr'act is in the middle. But yeah, yeah. The, the, oh, the yeah, you're right. Sorry, you're right. right. That is, yeah, it's the overture. There is no entr'act. But uh, the overture. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's the overture. They play the overture for two and a half minutes on black screen, even on right. Disney Plus, and people just don't know what is. It fooled me. So. Another. Yeah. Evolved. Well, Arch. movies. Movies used to do that. I mean, you'd sit there and you'd hear the thing as you came in it was much more like a theater experience um well i uh, you know as a completist it's great that they do that i mean it's kind of cool Agreed. They, they they keep that in there it's good like on tcm where they'll put a title card up and say like overture yeah, yeah. um but they they're not doing that on disney plus and well, people are like what's going on the other thing that that i you know as you know I, I i literally we literally could sit here all day and talk about the black hole but there's a million other things i want to talk to you about i just want to ask you both uh, your opinion about what happens at the end of the black hole <laughs> go now you guys were around in the 70s so and you were you know you were appropriately aged so maybe you understand what happened at the end of the black hole I still don't get it to this day. I, I've stopped trying to figure it out and just accept it for what it is. And I'm a big fan of the movie. So, you know, I, I've accepted it. But I'm just curious to know. I'm just curious about your guys' opinion about what happened at the end of that movie. I, for me, it's a David Lynch moment. Um, you know, ask David Lynch what his movies mean. And you're yeah. pretty much what the end of that is. You kind of <laughs> bring to it what you want to. And I... I'm pretty certain as we were making the movie, they didn't have, a, have any idea of how this is going to be, what they're going to do. They were all, everybody scratching their heads trying to come up with something. So they obviously came into the thing of maybe it's heaven, you know, maybe it's another universe that we've never discovered, you know, but it's something far beyond our intelligence. So if we're <laughs> asked to understand what it is, no, it's, you know, you're, you're not smart enough. I'm sorry. No one has so, I, you know, th that's sort of what I got, that they just came up with something so over the top that you kind of could write in what you wanted, your own interpretation. But let me ask you something, Kev. Yes, sir. Have you heard about a remake? Because I was contacted like, I don't know, maybe a year, year and a half ago by Radio Disney, and they did a whole hour with me. We got Captain Star today. And of course, there wasn't enough to talk about other than, you know, they, they were talking about there was going to remake. So they, if they were to, so if they were so shallow as to only talk about your role as Captain Star and not no, no, your no, incredible no. direction no. of <laughs> Home Entertainment Center. They couldn't. And, no, they, they couldn't. So we ended up talking about, you know, my Jason Lives, my Stephen King movie, my, you oh, know, yeah. all this horror stuff. And I go, but this is Radio Disney. Do you really want to hear about this stuff? <laughs> So it was, it was, yeah, very strange. But you know, the main thing was this thing about a remake. Have you heard anything about that actually happening? So you know, you know what happens, Tom, is every so often, everything rolls around to being talked about making a remake. And I don't know that that you know this or not. Um, uh, and and this is for both of you. Do you know that there was a comic book sequel to the Black Hole? No. I know. Yes, I, I have the comic book. I didn't know there was a sequel too. Yeah, that they come out on the other side, and there's something with dinosaurs, and uh, that just outrageously like, what the hell is? If you thought the end of the movie was strange, <laughs> wait till you see what's on the other side. You know, like it was really strange. But Tom, just to answer your question, everything rolls around yeah. into remakes every time. There's a and usually it happens around anniversary times, like if they're going to, uh, you know, promote a particular anniversary. I didn't get any special Blu-ray for the 40th of Black Hole, just saying. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like every time we get to one of those those kind of monumental sort of uh, uh, anniversaries, it's like up oh, and, you know, there's there's chatter about they may remake this movie. Uh, you know, it happens every five years uh, for Flash Gordon or anytime Sam Jones appears anywhere. 
Well, the question uh, is know. whether the, has there been a script? I mean, has anybody scripted it or they've done anything like that? Because that, no, that I've, usually means I've heard of they're nothing. They're more sincere because yeah. they got to spend money, you know, on a yeah. writer. Yeah, I've well, heard I'm, nothing. Well, what's odd about too is we all know Black Hole was not a financial success and just the way it's viewed. Um, I mean, usually like a remake, it's like, oh, we're going to remake Psycho or which they shouldn't have, or, or something else, or Ben-Hur, something that was a big hit before. Because uh, I heard that same rumor about Black Hole, and I thought, why? Yeah. And I think it, it, every, it comes around to everything, Nick. No, I was going to say, I think it also has to do with uh, when there's like a slow news cycle going on uh, at the same <laughs> time, and people are kind of starting for clicks on the internet. I think that, uh, that in, in turn has something to do with it as well. So, uh, yeah, I think it's just part of the contribution. Someone's at my door. I'll be right back. This is exciting. Oh, <laughs> is this is this a planned visit? Who is I'm it? Maximilian Shell. Did you invite him over for to, to to just hop in? I'm not hitting pause. I I think I hit Maximilian Shell. Isn't he the only guy Amazon. who's? It's the new script for the Black Hole. It just came. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He usually they oh, knock oh. and then just leave a package. He wouldn't leave. Am I wrong about this? Is Maximilian Schell the only the only actor who's still alive from the main cast? I I thought he died. Did he die? I think oh, so. I if, if that's Fox the case, I think I, mean, I think uh, they've all. Borgnine's dead. Uh, you got Mignot? Is she she gone? She might be alive. Also, I don't know. I, I, it's I, that was another. I, I said I don't know if you heard Stephen or not. But, I was suggesting that Maximilian Shell was at your door and you had planned a surprise for us. Uh, he, he, by, died by bringing... in two, he died in 2014. Okay, so not terribly I thought so, then, yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I'm plus uh, and five, uh, minus five years, so that's about right for me, so. But in the ballpark. That was a big thing for us because she was in this uh, Dr. Kildare TV show years ago. Uh, yes. Tiger Tiger was the title of that. And mm -hmm. all of us guys went nuts how beautiful she was. So yeah. <laughs> for Steven and I, it was like, oh my God, yeah, you know, so, and she was the sweetest person. She was, it was just great, you know, to get a chance to talk with somebody that was such a romantic interest. You know, that's, that's a good question too. Did you guys get to interact? I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of big legends uh, in that movie with you there. Yeah. I, I know, didn't. We were we were Shell we were the lowly extras on the side <laughs> of this. Uh, Tom was because he was in it more and, and had a you know the job doing that. But I mean, we saw him, looked at him, but uh, nobody looked at you, Stephen, and was like, "Get me a coffee, kid." <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, yeah, Mister. I, I really Ryan, bonded I'll with run uh, right out Robert. and get you one. I bonded with Robert Topser, uh, and because he was just such a guy's guy. And then years later, I was able to actually cast him in one of the movies I was doing. So that, that was wonderful to look at him, you know, as kind of a hero and then actually get to direct him later on. Did he, uh, did he remember you from the oh, yeah. Black Hole experience? Oh, no, that's great, that's great. Yeah. Okay, so I, I need to transition because we literally will just pick, and then what happened? you know, <laughs> all day on the black hole, but I need, I need to do this. And I, I've prepared the, I've prepared uh, the sandwich and Mr. Monty there that, uh, that this was going to happen. Um, sometime after maybe five or six years, four years, five years after, did you guys collaborate to create home entertainment center as a one man show? Well, no, what it, I'll give you, try to make it brief. How it started was full history. Uh, I had done these shows and I wanted to do a new show, but I wasn't sure what it was. And there was this tiny theater uh, called the Chamber Theater, 33 seats. And and they said, well, maybe I want you to go and look at it. So I went over to look at it and they opened the curtain and there was this hyper realistic kitchen set like you do for True West. And I looked in like that. I said, wow, this is amazing. It was a show that had bombed that I had closed in a week. And I said, guy, could I use that? And they go, yeah. And I go, does that stove work? He goes, no, but we could fix something up maybe. Anyway, I had a bunch of different ideas. And so I sort of put them together in this first version there. So literally the set came before the play. <laughs> and I wrote this play. It was The original version was very different. And it was about a guy who had quit a job. And then uh, he kept getting these calls to come back and do it again. And you weren't sure, guy, what was he? Was he a... a, a 
a male prostitute? Was he a drug runner? Was he this, this, this? And then it finally ended up, he delivered gorilla grams. And so it ended up with me putting this gorilla suit going on. There were elements from, and some of the songs that were in the other one. So I did that. And then I just, it was like, you know, no, not work. So we took some time off. Then I reopened, I rewrote it like over four and a half months at the Glendale Public Library. And uh, I had this image of a guy coming home from work in a suit and, you know, chanting, going banks, banks, bank. And then being having to do something, write this speech and being distracted. So I rewrote the whole thing, kept some of the elements and did it at that theater. Then this guy, Charles Duggan, a producer, wanted to do it in San Francisco. I thought, okay, this still needs work. And so then that's when I brought in Tom to direct it. And uh -huh. Tom came in there. And then he's the one that really lifted it up, coming up with bits and shtick and, and just focusing the performance. And uh, so I've been able to try stuff out over a long time with, you know, in front of audiences and so forth. And it, it was good. It was okay. But when Tommy came on board, that's, and we worked. Uh, together to do it and they went up to San Francisco and opened and it was a hit up there and then Showtime came and said they wanted to do it as a special and then Tommy directed that too so and then you know we still kept working on stuff when we were in San Francisco still tightening it and you know you can always improve things so uh, that's that's a sort of brief <laughs> a brief thing on what brief history yeah but yeah when when the world was exposed to it it's when you and Tom uh, collaborated, Tom directing and, and you starring in um, the version that they filmed for Showtime. And uh, I can tell you, I'm going to promote it right now. It's on, um, I think it's on Amazon Prime. Yeah, it's right? on Amazon Prime. You can see it. And it's called Apple too. Banks Home Entertainment Center. And uh, I have to tell, uh, you know, just adding my own, my own bit into this. That's my first exposure to Steven and subsequently unbeknownst to me, Tom, uh, Tom's work uh, uh, in directing. And I have to tell you, if you've never seen it, you're, you, you're missing out. The best one-man show I've ever seen. And I mean, just a phenomenal performance. Like, was that multiple performances and you cut it together? Was it a single performance? Yeah, no, we, well, by the time we shot it, I had done the show about 441 times. And we shot over three, we did, we shot three shows. We did like a matinee where we had, Tommy had a lot of cameras in the, in the audience and so forth, a smaller audience. Then we did a show that night with the full audience at the Marines Memorial Theater, which sat about 600. And then we had also shot the night before. So we had three um, shows to tape from, to choose from. And then Keith Truesdell was the, was the editor. And, um, yeah, that's uh, so it was so we were able, but I'd done it so long. I mean, the show was very tight by that point. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, but we had to expand it to a bigger stage because the one act where I'd done it before was smaller. It was right. intimate. It was like 140 seats and the audience kind of raked. In my theory, that was the best place to see the show because you really felt like you were in the room with the guy. Um, and so we went when we went to the Marines Memorial, which is a bigger theater, instead of like three steps to the refrigerator, it was six steps. There we go. And it was weird. It added this time. So we had to cut some stuff out. The show ran about an hour, nine, hour, 10. So we had to cut it down under an hour for showtime. So there was a whole piano keyboard bit that we cut out. And then we cut some of the verses of the songs and certain things because it had to be an hour. And then I had, because no one knew who the hell Stephen Banks was, we, I had my friends Penn and Teller do an introduction to it, which I think you can see on YouTube where they're standing, they're yeah. standing by the, uh, under the, the green Golden Gate Bridge. of uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Yes, and we did, it's exactly the shot from Vertigo because Teller's a big Hitchcock fan as I am, but yes. we, yeah, we, we created the, the thing from that and Tommy directed that. We had the shot where they're looking over and so they did that intro. That's not on the Amazon. It is on not, Amazon, no. you don't see that, but and they and they they cut out the nude scene too, which has always bothered me. Yeah, <laughs> that one. Fortunately, there was no nude scene. <laughs> I, I I thought it was missing something. Now I know what the something is, and I'm just going to ask this. This is how big of a fan I am. But be honest, at least one of those cuts is the pencil scene. Well, the pen, yeah, yeah, the pencil scene. This is true story. I, when I first did the show, I literally cooked cookies on stage. 
And when we were down here in LA at Chamber Theater, I put them in the oven. We couldn't use the real stove, but we put a hot plate in it. We'd warm it up before the show and I could put it in and they would cook <clears throat> chocolate chip cookies. I would make them. And one night I go over to get, you know, the bell goes off. I go, it's cookie time. I pull open the stove. It's stone cold. We had forgotten to, or it got turned off and it's like, and I'm looking down at just raw cookie dough. And I'm thinking, I've got to kill like six minutes. This is ridiculous. So I went back, I sat down to, because the character's trying to finish this speech that he lost for his boss on a typewriter. That's how long ago it was. And then I just picked up a pencil and started tapping it, tapping it, tapping it, and playing, playing with it, knocking it off. And then I knocked it off the table and flipped it off and that, and I kept doing it a little farther. And I'm thinking, what the hell I'm going to do? Finally, I hit it. And it went towards that window. And I thought, could I get that out the window? I got to kill time. So I kept doing it, doing it, doing it. And then finally I got it out the window. The crowd erupted. So then um, I said, I've got to keep that in. And oh, I had yeah. to practice it. But you couldn't, if I got it out too soon, it wasn't an accomplishment. Right. But if it went too long, it was just boring and awful. And then Tommy helped come up with bits like where I put the the Olympic thing on and do the Olympic oh, yeah. theme and, oh, yeah. and, and run around. So well, it's a little shorter than it is in the, uh, in, on the tape, but it still works. It just, it just looks like, it looks like the way that this, the way that it's cut and maybe Tom can speak to this, the way that it's cut, it looks like you're missing. And finally the director uh, went, you know what, when he gets one cut to that. So that we're not <laughs> sitting here all day watching Stephen Banks trying to flick a pencil out of his house. And as far as bits goes and the pencil bit goes, whoever the genius was that put 200 pencils in the drawer <laughs> for you to take out and then put in the cup when you run out of pencils, I bow to you, sir. That is one of the funniest <laughs> things I've ever seen in my life. Well, it just, it's the first was improvised and then it just kept adding and we just kept adding little bits to it and perfect, you know, what could you do this, this? Okay, it's like this. And it was something an audience could identify with, but I had to be very careful because a couple of times I got it out in like the second or third one and it, was, <laughs> it just blew it away. It was like, damn it, you know? So first <laughs> I had to intentionally miss, but look like I was trying. And then I had to really get down. And then sometimes I, don't, I just literally could not get that damn pencil out. I was going, going. And then what I would do is I would take that entire 50 pencils and I just chucked the whole thing at the window um, because I knew you could only go on for so long. We kept a chart in the theater in the lobby of how many, when they walked in, they saw this chart and it just said like one, four, seven, eight. It made no sense <laughs> until the end of the show when I did a and a and then explained what it was. So, so, so Tom, uh, I, I want to make sure that you're an active part of this conversation because the collaboration that I showed to literally probably at this point, thousands and thousands of people on an old VHS tape that I illegally taped off of Showtime and kept in a special <laughs> case because I was terrified it was going to one day uh, rot and I would never be able to see this thing again because there was no official release of it. Mm. How does, what does that <laughs> phone call look like coming from Stephen Banks? Like, so Tom, you know, I'm doing this show and I need to bump it up a bit. And you know, what, what, how does the, what's the genesis of your involvement there? And, and, and what did you think about that? Well, I mean, we've been such pals for so long. I, I don't think there was a phone call. We were probably just, you know, going to a movie together or whatever. And, you know, I'd seen the show that he had first done and I thought it was terrific. So it was, you know, very exciting for me because I, you know, I come from a very visual comedy background in the terms of you know, the kinds of things that I love and, and, and you know, always wanted to do. The thing that was so great about the show for me personally was, you know, Stephen is so great at all these different skills. So it was a question of every night being able to sit there, you know, with a pencil and paper and, and, and the audience and go, okay, we can tighten that up. We can fix that. Oh, how about, the, you know, so that by the time that thing was shot on Showtime, it was bulletproof. I mean, there wasn't anything to change. Everything worked. Night after night, the audiences roared. I mean, it was like a phenomenal hit up there. And there wasn't anybody that didn't go and see it and didn't laugh their heads off. But it was that it was so great to be kind of part of something that, you know, really worked. But it was, you had the advantage, unlike film, where you shoot it and you hope it works and you cut it together, to have a live audience. You know, as the Marx Brothers and some of the great comics that we loved, try things out with an audience, then shoot it. You know, obviously right. you can't do that anymore. But 
this was one of those times where you could, as Stephen said, you had so many performances just to really hone that down by the time, you know, it was taped, you know, it, it was like at its peak. I mean, yeah. it, it, go ahead, Nick. No, I'm just kind of curious because uh, like for myself, I've worked in like the news industry for for a while and I- I'm thinking myself that whole time. I'm like, you, you easily would have got, Stephen would have got his 10,000 steps on his Fitbit while he was uh, out on stage if that was a thing then. I- I'm just curious for both of you guys, uh, like how exhausted were you at the end of it? Because there was just so much energy that was being displayed and running around everywhere and having to call cues to camera guys and for the edits and this and that. Like just how, once after the show was actually done, just how burnt out did everybody feel? Because as a viewer, it was fantastic, but it's like, wow, I wish I had that kind of energy after the fact. Um, Look, even you- when he comes out for his bow, he looks like he's about to fall over on the, the Showtime <laughs> special. Um, it was, I mean, it, it, it was tiring. I was younger then, obviously. It was tiring, but on, you know, Saturday Saturday nights, I'd do two shows. we do like a seven and a nine. I can't and- even it it and you know i mean i would take a shower in between after the show because i was but lucky i was one thing that made sense so i thought okay what's the most comfortable thing to perform in pajamas right <laughs> so it was you know lightweight cotton pajamas so that wasn't a thing you know i didn't want to sweat because i hate sweaty performers unless you're supposed to be um so if you notice you probably don't see them but there there was water all over the stage in all sorts of little glasses and cups. It's all over the stage. Oh yeah. And there was one that we actually had that we had to cut out. There was this one that would it played the Mickey Mouse, uh, who's the leader of the club, the, the melody each time. But it was weird. You couldn't really tell where it came from because just the way the sound and people would go. But yeah, so I, I make made sure to keep myself hydrated and uh you know could wipe my brow and so forth. But yeah, it was nonstop. Um and so it was exhausting, but it was thrilling. It was exciting. I mean, it was it was really jacked up. And then I would, you know, rest in between the shows when I did two. Um, it was a good. It was a good workout. <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly once, seemed it. Once we had the show really down, then then I had to start fucking with him. So there, there's the part where he goes over and looks into the toilet. You know, I put like you know his his professional picture in there with him. You know, smiling, so he opens up and then watching him try not to laugh, you know, just had me in hysterics. Well, then that's what he did. One thing he did, we we came back to LA after because it ran about almost in Europe and San Francisco. And we came back to LA. I did a couple weeks at the Pasadena Playhouse in their upstairs theater, and then I did it at the Cannon Theater um in Beverly Hills. And Tom had to actually go because he was shooting a movie up in uh, Canada it was a thing about all these nuns being, nuns being murdered. And he had told the, the propers that it's an opening night, go do the thing. And I go to open the toilet and he had her put in like four baby Ruth's or whatever candy, which of course didn't look like baby Ruth's candy. So I opened the toilet and I see these, you know, little candy turds in there. Um, so that was, uh, that was a surprise. <laughs> yeah, you never knew what was gonna be inside that toilet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that kind of uh, you, you know, having done theater, I understand you know that 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 kind of uh, you know play that you get out of that. But I, you know, I want to I, I want to talk about that in, in the kind of not knowing what might happen aspect of things. Mm-hmm. For example, one of the things on the special that I think gets a humongous laugh, and then there's a joke immediately following it. I think that a lot of people miss, and that is uh, Siamese twin cookies. <laughs> yeah that was i'm making the cookies and i bring them out and just what happened was one night i pulled the cookies out you know and i put the raw dough in it and they cooked and two of the cookies had like were together because yeah. i put it too close yeah and it was just improvised it was just i saw it and i just went oh my god Siamese twin cookies and then i you know cut them in half with a spatula like, uh-huh. ah! and then i just like the twins are alive and it was just one of those great moments where it was, it, it was a brilliant and, and there then, was a looseness. Yeah, but, the, but and, then, because you're recovering from that, which is hysterically <laughs> funny, you know, you know, in the opinion of every person that I've ever showed this to, it's a hysterically funny movement, and you're still laughing when you then take the tray and go after birth and scrape oh, the crumbs that's right. off into the plate. And so many people miss that <laughs> joke. You know, that I'm just like, this is the nature of theater and you're seeing it right in front of your eyes. The ability on the fly to not only come up with, I'm going to separate 
the Siamese twin cookies and have a wonderful moment. But then just in the shadow of the laughter, there's another joke kind of crammed in there. Uh, yeah, it's fine. It's, I actually had forgot about that. That was right. It was just, I remember the first time there was just more cookie residue, crumbs and yeah. stuff like that. And I just thought, here it is. So, I mean, it's not, those were like key moments, improvising the cookies that time and the pencils. But once the two things were, once I did that, when I repeated and Tommy, but that's what great, what a great director Tommy is. You always had to make sure that it didn't seem like you were a robot and you were doing everything had to seem like it was for the first time, which sounds right. simple. But if I did that pipe too fast on, you know, if I didn't look at the pipe and go, huh, that could be something, then put it down and then do the precise going across like a periscope, you wouldn't get the laugh. Same thing with the cookies. And so everything had to seem like it was happening the first time, but also, so there wasn't a lot, there there wasn't like, it wasn't like a loose improvised show. It should feel like it's all happening the first times, but it was very, cause Tom and I had both done mime and we had studied Chaplin and Keaton and Laurel and Hardy and all. And so there was a real precision to it, but it had to come off natural, um, right. naturally, or you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get the laugh. But when those moments come, cause I do like to improvise, you know, you, you got to grab it and say it. And I'm oh, sure yeah. there were some I did that didn't work out. <laughs> um, so uh, again, because I don't want to spend, and literally this could be the entire uh, uh, Kevin Fawns over home entertainment center uh, for the entire interview. But <laughs> As we're moving on, uh, you know, past the the black hole and past home entertainment center. So, what? Ha where do you go then? Because the, you know, like reading your CVs, it's kind of like you guys have done everything. <laughs> like literally, the two of you have mm -hmm. done literally everything. And then, uh, you, you know, Tom Tom does in in the opinion of people in this room. Uh, a film in in one of the greatest horror franchises ever, um, the one we call the one with Horshack, uh, and uh, you know, a uh, uh, Friday the Thirteenth, Jason Lives, and I know uh, Nick. Nick is a humongous horror fan. I know he has some questions about that. Yeah, yeah, because um, I will say that your film came after what I would consider the worst installment of the Friday the 13th. So like everything just got turned around and just was really spectacular after that. Um, I read that when you made the movie, you wanted especially that opening sequence to be almost like a, a black and white kind of film. Was that kind of like for a particular style you wanted throughout the whole uh, uh, movie? Or was that something that you were looking for in terms of just kind of like a, a nod to the classic like universal uh, horror films that you know everybody is um, a fan of. Like, what was the stylistic choice? It actually was a little bit of both, Nick. It was like, on one hand, you know, I was hired and I had one one command: bring back Jason. You know, and it's like, well, can I have humor in it? And it's like, you're not going to make fun of him, no. You know, it's I just want the kids to be likable and stuff. It's like, okay. Mm -hmm. And then I was free to kind of do anything else I wanted, and they were incredibly supportive at Paramount in that regard. Um, so the two things I wanted to do was, uh, obviously all my influences are, are gothic horror. And all that came from was the universal, you know, Frankenstein, Dracula, you know, all those great you know, universal classics. And then there was something George Lucas had said years ago that, you know, after you, when you're making your movie, look in dailies and see what it looks like in black and white, because you want that contrast to be happening. So I've said this a number of times, you know, after you've seen the movie a few times, turn off the color and just watch it in black and white. It, it's very cool. It comes off, you know, very different feeling, but you really get much more of the Gothic horror look. And then of course I was, you know, stole the Frankenstein lightning bolt to bring back Jason, mm -hmm. which to me was the only way you're gonna bring back something that's dead to bring it back to life. But I never looked at Jason as a zombie. You know, I've always had this controversy with fans going, well, there's the pre-zombie Jason and there's a the zombie Jason. I go, he's not a zombie, you know? I even <laughs> have to shoot him in the head and he doesn't die, you know? But they didn't know what else to call him. I know, to, to me, Frankenstein's not a zombie. You know, he's undead, you know, and you can't kill him. But it really was those influences of Universal and that, you know, that one thing I remember hearing George Lucas say. 
So, so you say that the, the, you didn't have much direction other than like try to not, you know, not to make like a goofy uh, kind of movie, but outside of from the studio, um, what kind of blowback was it from the MPA? Because uh, I've heard that they, they've toned the down, they've toned down the movie so much that it was an absolutely different cut versus what you want. Or at least I read that's what it was. I wasn't exactly sure how, how much they altered your, your decision on the movie. So what did that end up being like? Well, I actually, I mean, we had nine screenings for the motion picture rating board, nine. And every time it was, you know, what we call frame fucking. Just take a few more frames off of that, a few more frames. <laughs> we never lost any complete sequence. Um, the movie before me, Part five was directed by Danny Steinman, who had come out of porn. So he had a lot of just heavy sexual things about it. And, you know, and the oh, that was much it. more gritty and, you know, and green, you know, much, much more dark grindhouse. Mm -hmm. One night I was sitting next to Quentin Tarantino with a group of us at dinner. And he goes, you know, you know, my favorite one, you know, I loved yours. It was great. It was definitely the, But part five, I go, you're the only person I've heard Say that. Why did you love part five? Because it's disgusting, it's despicable, it's horrible. It's a Friday the 13th, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, go figure. Uh -huh. Then the guy after me was John Buchler, who was a makeup effects person. So he went all the way with the effects. So he really got his stuff cut out, and as did Don, Danny Steinman. So I came in going, you know, I'm gonna, I don't wanna lose any of these sequences. I'm just going to shoot them in such a way that it's going to be minimal what they can cut. So they would pick on weird things like the sheriff back then. You know, it's like, and there's not a drop of blood in it. It's a, it's a gag, really, mm -hmm. uh, that I wrote for Dick Van Dyke and Tommy Smothers to do on their show, on Dick's show years ago, called The Chiropractor. And it was just using two pieces of human being to bend them back. And I thought, all right, let's do it for horror. And they, they kept coming back to that one saying, no, more, take more out, take more out. So, you know, it, they just really felt like that whole genre they wanted to, you know, pick on. You know, Siskel and Ebert, you know, <laughs> went on and said, all right, the next thing is another Friday the 13th. And, you know, it's going to be the same thing. It's all this stuff, you know, and, uh, we really don't recommend, you know, you to see it. And then Gene goes, yeah, in fact, we didn't see it. We didn't even want to bother to see it because we knew what we were going to get. And I'm going, that's great. <laughs> you know, kill it, give it two thumbs down and not even mm -hmm. watch the movie. It so crazy. It was that period where people were out to hate them. Well, let me ask you this, because again, now, um, you know, the, the industry's changed a little bit. Uh, I will say that the horror genre, uh, as Kev alluded to, is, is my favorite uh, compared to, you know, stuff that's like the comic books, you know, sports that I'm into as well. Uh, horror continues to grow uh i just personally love the the fans the industry and everything so what's your evaluation of where the genre is the fans are right now because it seems a lot more unique at least to me uh compared to um other um outlets and and uh genres as well so wh what do you think of the industry as a whole kind of right now as we stand well it's it's sort of divided there is there's the fan base from the, you know, the movies of the 80s. And that just keeps building. I mean, 34 years later, you know, the, my Friday the 13th is more popular than it ever was. And each generation, you know, sees it. And it's sort of like the entry drug into the series. Lots of times people say, well, see this one because this has a little more of a story and it's not as graphic and whatever. So, so many people have seen it and then go, oh, I want to see more of these and then go back and see the first one or, you know, the last one, Jason Goes to Hell, um, or Jason Meets Freddy. But there, so there's that whole group and they have conventions. They, you know, they keep us alive, you know, photo signings and all that kind of stuff. And then there's obviously, you know, the new generation of, um, you know, from uh, paranormal on that are trying to come up with something new, which I think is great. Um, I don't know if you guys have saw the, the thing that, you know, that, that's on, um, a shutter um, called Host. Which I called, love it. I yeah. love that film. So damn yeah. good. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, you Thanks know, it's a great use of Zoom and it really delivered. I mean, it was only what, 55 minutes or something long, but it was very short. Yeah. Yeah. But it, you know, to me, that's, that's the thing that I keep hoping people will discover um, that there's somebody will come up, you know, I teach 
film directing and producing at, at Chapman University. And I'm always telling these basically teenagers, you know, who just, you know, got into college, blow us away, take all these influences and, you know, create something new because it's only new if you can combine a bunch of things. There's nothing ever going to be truly new, but it's like you take from this, take from that. And I said, which is what I did with Friday. I just took kind of screwball comedy and put it into a Jason movie and tried to at the same time have more of a story where Jason had an agenda and Tommy had an agenda. So, you know, what was going to happen come the end as, far, as opposed to just arbitrary killing. So, and of course, and of course, leading off the movie with comedy legend Ron Palillo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was a wonderful coup to be able to you know get him in there. And, and it's interesting too, because Tom Fridley, who was in the movie, is uh, John Travolta's uh, cousin. Um, so you know, I've, you've got all this sort of welcome back Cotter in that in that in that movie. Yeah, I've actually um, 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 speaking of of Friday Thirteenth Part Six before just before we move on, you know, I, I've had a bunch of of the people from the movie on this program throughout the years, uh, show you know, like convention interviews and things like that, and you know, and it, it's it's always the same conversation. It just seems like everybody was having a good time on the set, and it seems like. Uh, you know, it was a wonderful picture that you produced. So yeah, well, bravo. we all had a ball, you know, we were all in our late twenties and it was, you know, shooting six nights a week, you know, one night off. And then we'd all go to some club in Atlanta um, and dance all night, you know, cause we had to stay on that <laughs> nighttime schedule. And so it was just a lot of fun. And as a result, we have become longtime friends. I mean, I'm, you know, I talk to these people all the time, not just the, the Facebook, I mean, not just Facebook and conventions, but, you know, texts and different things that we've really maintained a friendship, which is usually, you know, unheard of. Uh, you know, you're a family when you make the movie and then everybody, you know, goes their own ways. So it, it, was, it was a very special, you know, experience. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, it's, it's so fun to watch today and finding independent young creators who are making content um, that you you get attached to is, is really fun, but uh, Stephen, just to go back to you because uh, as you mentioned, you were involved. You uh, have been involved with SpongeBob for many years, which mm. is uh, our friend Dom's favorite <laughs> show probably growing up. And I know uh, he has tons of questions that he wants to ask. Oh yeah, I mean, I I don't want to to make it seem like growing up. I when I say I watch SpongeBob almost every single day. If I missed a day of SpongeBob, it was a bad day. <laughs> SpongeBob, I watched so much growing up. So having someone that I'm talking to right now who was a lead writer in SpongeBob for the lead writer, sir, the, the head writer, right? So the I, yeah. that's what I mean. That's what I mean. It's it's blowing my mind that. Um, well, what was it like? You know, working on a, a project like that. You know, SpongeBob's been around. I don't know how many years at this point. Oh, it's, it's like over 20 years decades. now. Yeah. Well, I came in, yeah. I, I came in on season. What was it like being in that? Uh, well, I came in on seasons uh, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I was, I, I wasn't there in the beginning. Um, I'd missed the first three of the seasons, mm -hmm. but I was a huge fan. I mean, it was such a great show. It was just like, it was so fun. I mean, kids could watch it. Adults could watch it. And um, so then they asked me, they said, after the third season, they hadn't decided whether they're going to really do more. And then that's when it sort of really exploded and became a phenomenon. And they said, do you want to, you know, work on the show? And they said, but you should know, we don't do scripts. We just do outlines. And I said, Hey, I would, it's, it's the best show on. I said, I would love to. So finally they called up and said, Oh, you're into consideration to come in and work on it. And they kept saying, you know, they don't do scripts. They just do out. I said, that's fine with me. I don't care. So, I went in and worked on it and we would do a premise, half a page describing it. And then we do an outline, which was like two and a half, three pages long, describing in detail the action of what happened. But we didn't write the dialogue. Um, that was all the storyboard people who did that. And then we would look at the storyboard, make suggestions, this, that. I would go to the records. But um, I knew several of the people who had worked because I'd known Steve Hillenberg just from because he was creating the show. I remember when we watched the first pilot over yeah. at this funky little place and was on VHS and they had the first one and he kept running going, I'm ready, I'm ready. And I go, oh man, they are. I was working on a show called Cat Dog. I go, they've already got a catchphrase. Um, and so 
it, I, had, it, I had a great time because in that show, it was a good bunch of people to work with. Uh, Paul Tibbet, who ran the show um, when I was there, was was really great. Very direct, specific notes. We had a lot in common. Um, a uh, very funny guy, and he he directed the second movie, and then he worked on the third, wrote part of it, um, and he uh, he worked on the show up until the last maybe three years ago, um, <clears throat> and he was from the beginning. He storyboarded actually the title sequence, so it, it was a really good group, and it was like we were like, what's you know, let's make things that we think are funny. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, what do kids think are funny? I mean, we were obviously aware it was a kids show, but. Um, yeah. but also we weren't trying to put in like a lot of pop culture references or, 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 you know, secret stuff or whatever like that. I mean, we did throw some things in like those, but, um, but it wasn't like, we weren't trying to make like a hip, you know, cool cartoon. Cause I, well, it already was very, um, but yeah, they just had a great crew there. It was well run and I had a terrific time and the writers that worked under me and with me were terrific and went on to do a lot of things. So it was, no, that was a good six years. What was so, it Tom, Tom Kinney, right? Was, wasn't he? Tom Spongebob? Kenny does the voice. Yeah. Tom, yeah, he, I don't know why I'm freezing up on that at the moment, but he described the process of making um, episodes to me in a, in a previous interview uh, and his whole face just lit up when he described it. Like, Oh, let me tell you what we did. And you know, he went through. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, for, Tom's for great. Tom is he's such a fantastic voice actor. He does a lot. He does, uh, I think the, the best series to me, am I after, uh, um, uh, uh, after SpongeBob was probably adventure time. And he does the voice of uh, uh, yeah. the, the King, you know, uh, on that. Um, but yeah, Tom is, he's just really funny and he is a fantastic voice actor and the variety in SpongeBob's voice most people don't get what voice acting really is. And all those guys are good. Bill Fagerbaki, who does Patrick, you know, you can't just stupid playing a dumb character. It can't just be one note and the variety. I would always laugh the most of his stuff during the recordings. And then Clancy Brown, you know, does Mr. Krabs and, uh, uh, you know, they're it's film, it's a, film it's legend, true. film legend, Clancy Brown, sir. film. Le film yeah, legend. yeah. He's something he's, yeah. There's a lot of, when you meet him that first time, he just kind of looks at you and you're like, I don't want to get on this guy's yeah. bad side. He's going to kill me by taking my head off. Yeah, there's a lot of gravitas with him. Uh, we we want to move on because, you know, I did promise sure. that I wouldn't take up both of your entire mm -hmm. days. So we want to know, uh, Tom, what do you got going on now? Tell us about the band, The Sloths. <clears throat> okay, well, um, just referring back to Friday the 13th, I wrote, finally, after 32 years later, I wrote a sequel to my Friday the 13th, which we're, you know, trying to get it made, but we have to wait for the lawsuit between the writer and the original producer to come to terms, so there's nothing that can be done right now with it, so I'm kind of, you know, sitting on that and writing some other scripts also in the horror genre, but I, yeah, I'm, I got back with this band that we formed when we were in a teens and 15, 16 year old and back in the 60s called The Sloss. And back in the day, we opened for The Doors, Iron Butterfly, The Animals, all these groups. And we were like 15, 16 year old kids. And suddenly, you know, like, I guess it was a, like 11 years ago now, 10 years ago, um, we find out that this little 45 that they had made called Making Love that nobody would play because the title was too provocative in 65 was this kind of underground hit, particularly in Europe. So it brought us all back together again to talk about it. We decided, well, why don't we get in the garage like we used to do, like a garage band and start playing. And one thing led to another. And so the band has been performing well, up until the pandemic, which killed the tours, <laughs> killed the tours and everything. Yeah. But, you know, we ended up doing an album and a vinyl album and a number of, of uh, music videos. Um, and, you know, it's been great because this is a bunch of guys in their 60s, now 70s, and doing the rock that we did in the 60s with probably, you know, more passion and energy. Uh, I am one of those guys who sweats, unlike Stephen. So at the end of every show, I look like I can come out of the shower with clothes on. But it's been just amazing to be able to do that again, go back and do a dream that was... You know, and and where can the kids... Uh... 
where can the kids pick up the album? Can they can they get that over at the Amazons or? Uh... Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have an Amazon anymore. But um, yeah, it's it's available if you go to thesloss.org, org. You, you know, it's available there, and the T-shirts and the cups and the you know all that stuff. And then if you just go on YouTube and put in the Sloss Band, because if you just put the Sloss, you'll get those cute little furry animals with the <laughs> free toes. Um, but, you know, you can actually see, you know, what, what we're doing, which is, to me, nice. still kind of amazing at our age that we're getting away with this. Quick question about your sequel to part six. Does it ignore seven through ten? Yes. It does. Okay. <laughs> it does. Yeah, I sort of felt it was okay because Halloween got away with it recently. Um, but basically, I, I kind of made it. Twice. I, I set it up by saying this was something that was found in the archives of this convent years later. And we believe this is true, but it's from those notes that I wrote this. So it's sort of like you can take it for what it is. And, you know, I wanted to do Jason in the snow, in the winter, Thanksgiving, religion. I mean, there's so many elements that have not been done in a Friday before, but it really is him being down there for 13 years. And then he comes up, you know, 13 years later, he's going to look a little different. Not, not a lot, but you can't keep something underwater for 13 years and not have it have some <laughs> effect on you. And, you know, if we've made the mask already, there's concept drawings that are out on it. That's in the new box set that just came out on the series. So yeah, it's, you know, sort of active and going, but, I don't know when we're going to get a chance to make it. Well, I, I mean, I think, I think based on your timing, we can still leave X, the funniest installment. We can leave that one in, I think, yeah. still. Because yeah. it sounds like timing-wise, it would still be okay to have X. Yeah. That's my... It's, it's yeah, they all have their Hysterically version. funny. Yeah. Hysterically funny movie, my opinion. Funny in a good way, where I thought part eight was funny in a bad way. So anyway, um, and Stephen, I know that uh, on top of uh, uh, of working in so many animated uh, uh, projects, you have a, a, a novel series as well. Very serious uh, adult novel series. Uh, not not adult, mi mi middle grade. It's not adult. It's a, it's a series, called, but it's horror. It's called Middle School Bites. Two of them have come out. And it's about a kid who's 11 years old. He's about to start middle grade. And the night before, the day before he starts, he gets bitten by a vampire, a werewolf, and a zombie. So he is a vam wolf zom, which in my research has never happened before. He's one third each of those things, but he still has to go to school and deal with it. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's a novel. It's uh, basically sort of uh, for kids, let's say, fourth grade through, you know, middle school, but it's also written that adults can enjoy it too. It's illustrated. I, I like it too. And he likes it too by Mark Frain. <laughs> and there are a lot of little Easter eggs and hidden jokes in this, in these books, even some references to home entertainment center. But oh. anyway, it's, uh, that's, it. that's it, the hook. I'm in now. <laughs> there we go. If you can get it at independent bookstores, please try to do that because uh, they are suffering during this. But if not, you can get it on Amazon. But and it's also good for like reluctant readers because it's written. It's it's very fast paced. It's funny, um, but still making a points about a point about a kid that's very different and unique fit learning to fit in in this school because they totally accept them. They have an assembly and they go, we accept everybody here. And so, you know, we're, we're accepting him. So it's not about him hiding it, um, but he has a lot of strange, funny things happen to him. So anyway, doing that, and then just recently started, in fact, tomorrow, uh, this new series, uh, animated series, Stan Lee's Superhero Kindergarten, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. And um, it's something Stan started, uh, obviously, before he died. And I had met with him on another project and it got the go ahead and uh, they approached me a year ago, but I was too busy to write it. But then subsequently a year later, they came to me and the timing worked out and uh, they basically sort of let me write the type of show I wanted to write and do it for kids and adults. And it's really fun. We've had four sessions with Arnold uh, recording and he is totally into it and having fun with his type care about a superhero that lost his powers, but all these kids got it. He has to go into a kindergarten and teach them but it's it's really out there. I mean, they really 
uh, they let me break the fourth wall and do a lot of stuff. And Arnold is so great about making fun of his persona and his catchphrases and everything. So anyway, oh, yeah. that'll probably be, I won't be out to the end of next year. Um, but that's, yeah, Stanley's superhero kindergarten. So oh, that, that well, and then I have some plays I'm working on, but right now those are the two main things, the books and uh, Arnold. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, we'll keep an eye out for, for all of those things. Uh, so make sure you check out, uh, the album, the books, the shows, the movies, the things, uh, everything that our two amazing guests, uh, Stephen Banks, Tom McLaughlin. We want to thank you, uh, from the bottom of our black hole hearts, uh, <laughs> for coming on and spending a little time with us today. We hope you'll come back when you have something like maybe when the cartoon's going to come out, Stephen, we'd love to have you back yeah. or. Or Tom, if you got something in the works and uh, you, you, you want to come uh, come on and, and let us know about it, we'd love to have you back. Um, I, and as I uh, uh, oh, I didn't mention this on the show. I have I have begged and pleaded uh, to have uh, Stephen play us out with one of the home entertainment uh, songs. Uh, but before we do that, we want to do the the plugs. So, uh, Mr. Monty. You can find me online as Monty's Mayhem. That's M-O-N-T-E-S-M-A-Y-H-E-M. I'm on uh, Twitter, the Snapchat, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, uh, all over the place. Uh, Big Kev, Mr. Big Kev, sir. Uh, you can find me over on the Xbox uh, One Nation as Big Kev GS, and I'm BK Geek Stuff everywhere else. Mr. Sandwich? Uh, you can find me on Instagram and the Xbox One Network at Fat Dumbledore, F A T D O M B L E D O R E. Outstanding! Great. I love I love how you the the connection froze right as you did that. Okay. Uh, and you can help us support the show for more awesome segments like this. Just head over to Patreon.com/slash/GeekStuff T N G. And, and if you, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, if you if you have any questions or comments about uh, today's show, any show, any topic, things you'd like to hear us talk about, questions we should have asked Tom McLaughlin or Stephen Banks, please by all means use the GVM line two zero one seven three zero two five four seven and leave us a message there, and you may hear yourself on an upcoming episode of Geek Stuff TNG outstanding we should also uh i just pimp out our email at geeksftng at gmail.com uh and with that mr big kev uh with that we are going to uh defer to uh the the legend of stephen banks uh to play us out with one of my favorite tunes from stephen banks home entertainment center which you can check out on amazon and uh, we thank you again, gentlemen, for joining us. Please don't leave. We, we, we got a couple of things to clear up with you right after the fact. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen to end this program the way we have never ended a program before <laughs> uh, by having Stephen Banks play us out live. Uh, are we doing the whole song? You want me to do the whole? You, you can do as much or as little of it as you like. So if you do the whole song, uh, we'll, we'll play the whole song out. It's up to you. It's a short <laughs> oh, one. We'll see what happens. I can remember everything. We should have Tommy singing. He can really sing. First you get the lighter, fluid and a match. Here we go now, everybody. Please stand back. I said, well, first it didn't light. Now we won't go out. Now the smoke is getting thick. And them bugs are coming out. At the barbecue. At the barbecue. Mom. Dad's gonna barbecue. Outside at night. Doesn't like to do it. Cause he never gets it right. I said, now uncle wants a medium. Sister wants it rare. Mother likes it real well done. The baby doesn't care. At the barbecue. At the barbecue. Mild mm, down, down, there. I'm a Jesus, I said. I sit here and darling, you sit there. I said. <laughs> My eyes were, oh yeah. Close your eyes, my daddy says a prayer. I said a plate for the meat. A play for the buns, I said, a table for the adults and the daughters and the sons. Doom, ding, down, the 
mom and dad gonna lay down the law don't blow those milk bubbles with your straw and don't talk with your mouth full of food and please don't go because it's extremely rude at the b a r hyphen b hyphen q u e punch down take it steve me okay <laughs> Yeah. I said, we had a great time at the barbecue. We laughed, we jumped, and we skipped, and we flew. I said, my sister got a hickey. My brother stubbed his toe. The baby spilled some milk. Well, well, that's the way it goes at the barbecue. At the barbecue, yeah, at the barbecue, well, at the barbecue, at my house. The great Stephen Banks. Thank you thank so you. much for that, Stephen. What a treat. Tom McLaughlin, Stephen Banks, thank you so much for being with us today.